starting to sniff some of that out. We'll see uh, if that does continue. And, and Chris, let's uh, expand the conversation. We'll bring in Layla Pence. She's president of Pence Wealth Management. And CNBC contributor Courtney Garcia, senior wealth advisor at Payne Capital Management. Uh, welcome to you both. And um, Courtney, you've, you've heard us talking here. In terms of a starting point for a portfolio right now, or if you're going to be thinking about how to shift things around uh, looking into next year, what opportunities have, uh, have been presented and what are the hazards that you think are most important? Yeah, I do think this idea that interest rates are clearly higher and the idea is they may stay a little higher for longer than people want them to be isn't necessarily going away quite as fast as people want, which is where some of your longer durations, so think of your tech, you do not want to be overexposed there. I do think that's likely going to continue to outperform, I'm sorry, likely underperform just as it has. You do not want to be overexposed. You want the exposure as the long-term investor, but I would not be actively over um, allocating there currently. What I do think is one of the bigger stories I don't think is being talked enough about is the reopening that's happening in China. I do think that's the second largest economy in the world and they, the pent up demand that the consumer is gonna have as they're starting to let the economies finally reopen is huge, not only for China and emerging markets, but the global economy. So we are definitely starting to look abroad and, and looking at some of those opportunities as well, because the valuations are really attractive and that reopening is gonna be huge moving forward. And Layla, uh, would you be advising your clients to seek out uh, more risk or, or back off from it going into next year, given you know, the reset we've seen in, in valuations and rates so far this year? We would definitely consider backing off some risk. We do see some volatility coming in the first and second half of the next year, and we need to be cautious with that. We're, we're cautiously bullish for the year, but the first half is going to be challenging. Okay, and, and in a, I guess, practical way, what would that mean in terms of uh, looking for ways to, I guess, stay relatively safe, whether it's in the bond market or, or different parts of the stock market at this point? Yes, we definitely like the defense area. We like financials. Uh, we also like the payment sectors and the fixed income. For the first time in, in 12 years, we actually have an interest rate. And so the clients can actually get an interest rate over 4%. So we really like the fixed income arena with some defensive stocks. And when you say um, defense, do you mean the defense sector as in military uh, contractors or you mean just more defensive parts of the market? Yes, defense sector, the defense sector, military uh, mm -hmm. area and also the defense area, defensive stocks like value stocks, like financials, like healthcare. We do like those areas quite a bit for the upcoming year. Chris, it seems like financials, um, you know, they, they kind of uh, pulled one over on a lot of investors this year. They had a massive run higher into this year. Everyone felt smart in January because it felt like everyone loved them and then they worked uh, and then it fell apart. Where do, where do you think that they, they're set up going into 2023 at this point? It's a pretty solid backdrop for the financial sector in general. You know, the mention around we finally have an interest rate is absolutely correct. And the way the cash flows work at some of the large financial institutions, you know, a rising yield backdrop above average yield backdrop uh, works very well for them. But right now there's a few headwinds on growth. There's a few headwinds. There's overly cautious talk about recessions coming. Um, so from that standpoint, the, that particular sector is taking a back seat. But as we head into a Fed pause, doesn't even mean a Fed pivot, a Fed pause, a higher stock of yields moving forward with a little bit of an expansion in the second half, that's where the financial sector uh, is, generally speaking, the sector of choice. So we would hang in there. Uh, we're still favorable on it in our CIO portfolios, and uh, we're going to remain that way heading into next year. Chris, you mentioned uh, a couple of times this idea of, of the Fed, whether it's forced to turn a little bit more dovish or uh, simply responding to the data in that way. Uh, how does that fit with, you know, all the reminders that Fed officials keep throwing out there that they expect to stay higher for longer in rates? They don't want to see financial conditions loosen too much. They feel as if they have to be extra sure that inflation is wrung out uh, of the system and expectations before they declare victory, especially if jobs, you know, remain plentiful. Yeah, it's so difficult to time these things as it relates to what the full effect is, is, you know, the cost of capital being hiked by the Fed and financial conditions, uh, obviously, you know, getting tighter and tighter and tighter and mixed with that, the fact that the money supply has gone negative and then now rents coming down and the housing market going through a rolling recession. So put that all together, they still see a higher stock overall, if you will, of inflation. They see the employment market staying 
strong at this point. So they have to be hawkish. Unfortunately, we just don't know what is around the corner in terms of how much the growth slump is. And that includes significant hikes that have already happened mixed again with lower balance sheets. So if you kind of run this story out, it's likely that their hand is going to be forced. The market's telling us that in the bond market. The bond market is really incorrect. Uh, so I think we're going to be looking at a situation here where the Fed might have to back off earlier than expected. Yeah. And of course, I would, I would say you don't have to look any farther back than 12, 13 months ago to see Fed rhetoric being pretty offside with what was about to happen over the over the following year. Courtney, um, wondering about uh, this idea. I know that you actually like the home builders, which is an interesting kind of contrarian point right here. Do you feel as if that's because just simply rates coming back in and giving, uh, you know, demand to come back online or is there something else going on in that group? Yeah, I do think one of the biggest things that's overweighing your home builders is the fact that mortgage rates are so high, which is really just pricing a lot of your buyers out of the market right now. But if we are seeing inflation coming down, and I do completely agree with Chris here, I do think likely we're going to see the Fed having to bring down rates a little sooner than later at some point next year. And that's going to bring mortgage rate down, which is going to bring that demand back into housing. But you just have to look at some of these long-term fundamentals. And especially with the millennials, which is the largest generation out there right now, is starting to start families, starting to buy houses. Just over the last decade, there were about 5 million more households created than homes built. And there's just this huge supply and demand issue that's not going away anytime in the near future. So these higher rates I see as a shorter term issue. But longer term, I do think this is a great opportunity. And you want to start to buy these in before the rates come down or before some of those longer term issues go away. I'm sorry, short term issues go away because once they go away, it's already going to get priced in. So I think you want to take advantage of that now. Yeah, I mean, obviously, they, they look super cheap because maybe the earnings have been overstated, but uh, we'll see they're well off their lows already. Uh, and Layla, how much does the, the Fed outlook play into uh, your portfolio strategy, what you would be looking to do with clients uh, for next year? It plays quite a bit uh, the way, you know, the the old adage, don't fight the Fed. And uh, we think we are going to have at least two more interest rate increases, probably February and March, and they're going to pause. And that will be then the signal that, that the companies can plan on the terminal rate. And, and that will be a really good thing for the markets and for our clients. So we definitely watch that on the, we watch all the indicators of inflation and CPI and PCE. I know we have a PCE number here coming up on December 23rd which is going to determine whether we're going to have a, a Santa Claus rally or not. So we're watching it constantly. Yeah. And then I guess if you think that, you know, maybe the first half of next year could be a little bit shaky in the markets, Layla, do you think that means we break to a new low or, or should we go under the assumption that perhaps the, the October low uh, could be reliable at this point? You know, in my experience, nobody ever rings a bell that tells you this is the bottom of the market. So mm -hmm. you really have to look and, and dollar cost average in when you see the certain sectors that you like are down uh, enough. And you just have to dollar cost average in because, as you know, the market turns very, very quickly when things get better. And you can't wait for that to make some moves. So we do think it is time to nibble back into the markets. And uh, mm -hmm. if it goes down some more, you buy some more. Yeah, uh, that's uh, that's usually uh, a whole lot easier than uh, than trying to pick the actual moment of the low. And Chris, I uh, wanted to circle back to something you uh, alluded to earlier about the approach to technology or growth in the coming year, that it might be more of a selective uh, view or, or kind of a bifurcated situation. What do you, what do you have uh, in mind there? Well, Mike, you, you and I and this panel knows that, you know, the leadership group of the past is rarely ever the leadership group of the next cycle. And it appears that that is already happening. We're in a bridge period right now where investors are trying to figure out what part of tech has staying power to it. And usually when you lose leadership, you, you lose it for a, a very long period of time. So if you split technology into three different types of camps, it's the long-term camp, you know, the pandemic uh, arena that, that benefited a lot of companies within tech or tech-like, and they uh, built their their business models off of really long-term market share grabbing type of business models and profit second. And that's an area that's going to be put off to the side, obviously with the higher uh, yields out there. The second camp is the higher yield, uh, the higher quality area that are providing you a little bit of yield, uh, growing slower right now. So also not immune from a downturn, but they're uh, more than likely to stabilize first. And that third one is the areas that will benefit uh, from the ongoing themes of the next cycle, and, and that could be the semiconductor arena. 
All right. Uh, interesting way to, uh, to break it down, uh, Chris. Thanks very much. And thanks to you, Layla and Courtney as well. Appreciate it.